National Referral Hospital, uh, specifically looking at the safe barriers and facilitators. So as a way of introduction, we are all aware of the UNH strategy of 1990-90, where we, are, we have set a target that by 2020, 90% of patients who are HIV infected should be diagnosed, and 90% of those diagnosed should be put on antitrovirals, and then the third 90 90% uh, of those that are on antiretroviral therapy should be virally suppressed. Uh, Uganda adopted this global strategy uh, towards the later half of 2014 and uh, incorporated it in the Ministry of Health guidelines uh, in terms of uh, being the preferred tool for monitoring response to antiretroviral therapy for our patients. And these guidelines basically set out to test HIV-infected patients who are on ART for at least six months and uh, determine whether they are virally suppressed or not. Um, viral load monitoring offers a lot of benefits to patients on antiretroviral therapy and uh, indeed one of the things that I carry uh, important is uh, guiding timely decisions for switching to a more appropriate treatment regimen if treatment failure is confirmed. Previously, the tools that we used to monitor used to maintain patients on failing regimens for a very long time uh, before we could actually switch them. But of course, we have timely indication for the need for adherence support, early detection of uh, possibility of developing drug resistance and more. So based on this, um, I want to describe uh, the HIV viral load cascade at Mulago National Referral Hospital, or the HIV outpatient clinic uh, that sits at Chirudu uh, as the medical services are being offered there. And uh, after describing the cascade, I would love to explore the barriers too and the facilitators for viral load monitoring among HIV infected adults at Mulago. So, the population of interest is uh, all HIV infected adults attending the outpatients clinic that have started antiretroviral therapy after December 2014 and this is when uh, the intervention was taken up by the clinic. So we shall definitely have every patient that has had at least six months exposure to antiretroviral therapy included in there. And uh, we, I plan to use quantitative and qualitative methods uh, to in two phases uh, in order to determine the cascade and then further on to determine the facilitators, the barriers and facilitators. So in the first phase of the study, uh, which is focused on assessing the, the assessment of current care, I'll use a descriptive cross-sectional method utilizing the electronic medical record system that is at the clinic but also reconciling this with the uh, routinely collected data from Uganda National or CPHL or Uganda National Health Laboratory Services. So I want to determine how many patients uh, are in the clinic, how many have had uh, their viral load done, but most importantly uh, whether they've had it in a timely manner. So we shall abstract information uh, from the patient's files using different, uh, for different variables of interest and uh, we'll have a trained team that is going to abstract this information and one of the key variables they'll look for are the social demographics, the CD4 cell counts and the duration that the patients have spent on antiretroviral therapy. This will be done by reviewing uh, medical records uh, that are already in uh, the clinic looking for compliance with the guidelines to assess for adherence to the viral load guidelines uh, in the clinic. So adherence will be quantified as proportions of actions taken compared with what is expected according to the indicators that are recommended by viral load guidelines, the Ministry of Health viral load guidelines. Ideally among those whose viral load is less than a thousand copies per meal, we will evaluate the proportion with the viral load that is performed within 15 months. 
that is uh, adding a three months window on the 12 months that are offered by the guidelines, Ministry of Health guidelines. So for patients who are virally suppressed after six months, uh, we are supposed to repeat the viral load one year after. So for those whose viral load was one, less than 1,000, we will add 15, three months to see how many have had their viral load performed in time. But those who will have performed it late will be considered uh, to be those that had, have had it more than 15 months, and those who have not had it will be considered as the never. Uh, for those whose viral load is 1,000 and above, ideally should have a repeat viral load after the intensified adherence counseling session of uh, three to four months. But uh, ideally it should be repeated within six months. And anybody that has had it within six months shall be uh, taken as an action that is appropriate. But anybody after that will be uh, taken as late. And those that have never had it will be considered as never. Uh, for those who've had two viral loads that are more than 1,000, we shall evaluate the proportion that was promptly switched to second line antitroviral therapy. And this is basically defined within three months. Those that do it after three months will be late, and those that never do it will be regarded as never. So with that information, we hope to come up, I hope to come up with a cascade that shows how many patients are eligible or were eligible and have actually received the viral load in timely manner. For objective two, uh, exploring the barriers and enablers, I hope to conduct uh, semi-structured interviews with the health workers and also conduct focus group discussions with the patients to determine the individual and contextual barriers and facilitate us with the uptake of these monitoring guidelines. So, the qualitative arm with the focus group discussions, I plan to have at least four focus group discussions defined by age and sex. I was hoping to get a female group of young people, less than 25, and those above 25, and then a male group of young men also, less than 25 years of age, and that above 25 years of age. This is to allow a uh, free flow of discussions uh, based on those uh, four uh, parameters. Then for the health workers, an in-depth interview will be conducted with key informants and a select uh, number of staff. The, the clinic has about 20 staff that it writes uh, its uh, services with. And I hope to uh, include a physician, a medical officer, two nurses, a lab personnel, and a counselor in this uh, interview that we shall be doing to determine what the health worker perceptions and, uh, and, and attitudes are towards uh, utilizing viral load as a, an intervention. So in, in determining what information I'm going to look for, uh, I'm going to apply the COMBB model uh, to the provision of routine viral load. And uh, this that I, was, that I put up here is only uh, focusing on uh, health workers. However, there are other, there, there's, another, there's, another, uh, there's another context of, of patients that should be here, but I was only able to uh, project this one. So these are some of the things that I am thinking about. These are some of the things that I'm thinking about that may actually hinder uh, the uptake of viral load monitoring. Uh, providers may not, in terms of capability, providers may not know which patients should actually have a viral load test. Uh, and then they may also not know when to request for the viral load. These may have changed along the way because we've had continuous trainings, but uh, still we, we have gaps as, uh, as reflected by the figures that we have because the client coverage for viral load monitoring is still not yet at 90%. So looking through these three domains, capability, motivation, and opportunity, of course, I think we may add some other, other factors within these three domains that are going to predict the behavior, which behavior we're talking about is optimal 
rates of viral load or actually the behavior is not suboptimal rates of viral load but that is what we are seeing because the behavior is not being uh, performed to the optimal or required uh, levels for us to suppress the viral load or rather for us to have all the patients have a viral load done. So right now as we speak I have only been able to develop the proposal uh, but I hope that by the end of April I'll have had the final proposal ready and submitted to IRB and uh, if all goes well data collection should begin shortly after in May uh, going on for about three months and then by September preliminary results will probably be available and before the end of October we'll have a final manuscript. I do welcome
Yeah. And so the outcome may be a, a global, but we may also have processing takers of each of those levels of the guideline, and that could help see where is the package within the whole chain and then be able to focus on that. Yeah. Thank you very much, Dr. Katama. I think I, uh, I think your your suggestion is uh, is is pertinent. Though I have looked at the guidelines, I may be corrected. They don't seem to be they don't they don't they seem to be quiet on uh, what window could be given for a patient to be considered having this. That's why we that's why I had included the three months win period. That maybe if somebody has had it later than three months, that one I should consider late. Because they seem to only be specific that at six months this should be done, at one year this should be done. So I'll, I'll, I'll look at them more closely and see if there's anything. So that would easily definitely help me describe the cascade even without putting it into one objective. And uh, I also agree with you that different, 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 uh, at different time points, Different people may be able to give you uh, information that is not that 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 is different from what another group would have given you. For example, the the if the, if you have people who have failed on antitrovirals, as opposed to the ones who are doing fine on antiviral on antitrovirals, then probably it's not a good idea to put them in one focus group discussion. Okay. So, uh, I have some. I was talking with uh, Turnaround time, 
uh, of the viral load results. So that may affect, that, that may actually impact on the proportions that get their viral load done. So maybe my only comment was that when you don't, don't just put a mixed methods design, because the, the, the mixed method, within mixed methods there are different designs. And it should be important for you, because if, if you're doing them separately, then it's parallel. It will be a parallel convergence design. But if one feeds into the other, depending on which one comes first, they are, they are labels for those designs, and it's important that you, you, you specify exactly, because then it shows what you call, how the two come together to become mixed. Uh, my, second point is, my second point is that it's on your qualitative study. In your presentation, you talk about semi-structured interviews, then I heard you talking about IDIs. Which, which is which? It should be IDIs for, for the health workers. Health workers. The health workers. Then the semi-structured interviews are, are very different, and mm -hmm. therefore should get choosy. I was a bit concerned about the FGDs, which are doing with the... The patients. Exactly. I'm wondering whether the information you're collecting is not sensitive information, and is IG our focus group discussion and appropriate place for them to to respond to these questions. Uh, maybe I, I didn't get the clear what exactly are you asking when the focus group discussion? What what data are you collecting through focus group discussions? So for for the focus group discussions I want to know how much the patients know about this intervention. The viral load as a monitoring tool for anti viral therapy. And uh, because I think if they know about it, they could also create demand from the patient side. So getting to know how much knowledge, what their attitude is, talking to some of them, they're not used to viral load. They're picking up over time, but they're used to CD4 cell count. Some of them do not know what exactly viral load means, and the way they interpret the results sometimes matters. And uh, they Maybe and then, um, this is a mistake because we were supposed to ask questions and you respond at the end. But I think my final question is you may want to consider whether there are no ethical concerns around this. Are you putting together people who are used to being together? And maybe would interviews be better and focus on discussions and creating that kind of information? Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you. Yeah, yeah, okay. um, yeah, we, we've, run of, we've run out of time. You know what? You don't have to answer my questions. You just take notes. You, you, I, I was wondering who, whether you have uh, supervisors, um, uh, perhaps you, you, uh, you know whether you have, when you don't know whether it's advisable to have some. Um, now, the, the, yeah, I was going to ask about records, but you clarified these are electronic medical records. And, and that's what you're going to analyze. So it will be very easy. You know, within two days, you can do all of these things. Am I right? You yes. Can, you can just analyze for them and get them. So objective one will be done. It will be done, but it requires someone who understands that I think I found oh, no, oh, no. you don't you don't have to oh, okay. answer. Yeah, yeah. Okay. But uh, but I assume it's uh, it's kind of some analysis of these uh, these of the data that already exists. You don't have to extract. You know? um, and then uh, I think um, she was talking about what outcome you are going to use, whether it's going to be. I also had the same question. Is it now? Remember there is. If you have a high it's like how many of those are eligible for ordering whose viral load has not been ordered in China, right? Then the, whether the results went or did not go, when they come back, and after they come back, whether well, they have reached the patient, you know what I mean? So I'm, I'm wondering what, uh, which of those, so are you going to say, I mean, which of those cascades Outcomes is the outcome. Is it going to be a combination? Do you understand me? Yes, from right from testing to when the patient was the patient. So I, 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 I didn't know which one, which one is going to be, to be the outcome. Um, I also wonder what 
Now, when you do one clinic, one clinic, are you going to generalize to the whole of Uganda? What's the generalizability? Because in Mulago, which you do an ISS, I'm sure there is a very big difference. Is it? It's, it's like it's like that there is. It's ISS clinic and, and Chinito, where you know everything is mixed up in Chinito, and the ISS everything works. So are you going to generalize these results to, to the whole? And, and, and that brings me to my last comment. You know what? It would be a very interesting study if you like analyzed for this. What do you call it? The, 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 the turnaround times for different things, and then you design an intervention to, to, to address those. I, I'm just wondering. You're just going to find out these things and facilitators and players and then go away. Am I right? That time. I, I don't know whether you know you would say where well, if we did A B C D. You know, because these parameters, you can get all of them by analysis. So you can know what the person is. And then you can do your intervention, whatever, based on what you find from your code B, you design an intervention that addresses those capability and motivation and whatever. And then, and then you look. You look at whether these turnaround times have, have improved, then you can. But, but that is only my own thinking. It's, you may say that's not what I want. But, but, and you don't have to answer these questions, they are always just a class. Okay, okay um, thank you. Uh, is it very quick? Actually, I seek the qualification for this comment. You mentioned something like uh, creating an object where you would search for potential interventions. Yeah. Could you please clarify that to go interviewing people? No, no, no. What do you exactly mean? Yeah, because it's going to interview people based on those barriers. For example, in the case you find that some people don't have either the knowledge or Based on that only model you apply, the knowledge and skills being given, whether some people are able to do what they are doing. But there's the issue of opportunity, the environment in which you work. It may be an issue of time, it may be an issue of resources, and other things. But there's also motivation as an element which has got the people who are effective and effective. You may be motivated to do something because you have the tools to do it. But you may also be motivated to do something because you have the knowledge to achieve something. And so by increasing your knowledge or looking at the benefit of doing something, you will be motivated. So through all what you will find out through the barriers, you can now think what are the intervention functions that need to address this. And then those who can package them into an intervention that you can later now say and develop an intervention based on the barriers. And then you can evaluate it to see whether it has worked in the setting. And then evaluate what made it work or what made it not work. So it is something like that. Thank you. Um, I think I'm at the interest of time and we need to move to the next person. But I hope that you got um, the key concerns and suggestions, um, particularly about the objectives, streamlining them, and where to start in terms of looking at this aspect. I'm going to look at how many people have time for one or we're going to look at it with the view that you're going to come up with some intervention to improve where the cascade is at and which might require using more than one site. But I guess you've got some, some feedback.